about you? I'm Hank. Welcome to Hamiltonville Farm. In this video, I've assembled a panel of experts to talk about everything they know about tractors, right? So if you're a new tractor owner or you're researching information on what to buy or what brand to buy or what considerations to take while you're thinking about buying a tractor, then this video is going to be for you. Even if you're an old veteran tractor owner, right? You just still like learning. This is the video you're going to want to watch. All the guys in this video have YouTube channels, and I'm going to link every one of their channels in the description below. Go ahead and click on their channel and subscribe to it because I'm telling you, the more you watch of these guys, the more you're going to like it. And of course, here at Hamiltonville Farm, we do tractor videos as well. We also do a lot of heavy equipment type stuff, so you can subscribe to us to get that kind of content. But we're going to kick off our expert panel with a heavy hitter. Our first guest is an expert at farming, and he knows a lot about tractors. So I want Josh from Stony Ridge Farm to kind of share his thoughts and ideas about what kind of tractor to purchase. So Josh, what you got, buddy? How about you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> just thought I'd give you a funny outtake. How about you? <laughs> uh, had to do it. I had to do it, Hank. <laughs> so, Hank, thanks a lot for reaching out to us, and thanks a lot also for bringing us all together as a community, because that's what we are here on YouTube is a community of creators uh, here on our property. So, my farm is a 150-acre farm. We've got a John Deere 5065 as our primary tractor. It's too small. It's too small for managing a 150-acre farm. I would say that we probably have somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 acres in grass. Imagine mowing 125 acres with a six foot mower. Well, six, seven, eight foot is about all this machine is gonna handle right here. So we bought an undersized tractor. And this is the first tractor I ever bought when we first bought our property. And I needed a utility tractor. However, I was kind of led in the direction of this tractor, and if I had to do it again, I would have gotten something in the 75 to even 100 horsepower tractor range for 150 acres. Uh, Hank, I'd tell you, uh, the biggest mistake that a lot of people make is just going out and buying something just thinking they're going to get by. Well, when it comes down to it, this is a 40 something thousand dollar piece of machinery. It's not something that you just want to get by. If you've got to spend an extra 15 or 20 grand to get what you need, go ahead and spend that money to get what you need. So on the back of the 5065 is a Woods Precision Super Seeder. It's the PSS 72 and it is heavy, man. It is really, really working and taxing this tractor. It will actually lift the front tires off of the ground on this tractor even with the weight of the loader system on it so it's important for you to think about the size of your tractor for the size of your property if you're getting a 15 acre property and you're just going to be doing a little bit of mowing a little bit of hauling a little bit of mulch and stuff like that then you can look in that 20 to 25 to 30 horsepower tractor range if you're getting a say a 50 acre place now you want to start thinking about something like the 5065 here something in the 50 to 70 horsepower range and if you're over 50 acres if you're closer to 100 acres my advice is go big or go home in other words look for something 75 horsepower and above and start thinking about a cab tractor at that point because you really have a lot of uh, dust and debris and stuff like that if you're working in the woods a lot you probably don't want to go with a cab tractor. If you're working out in pastures and fields, mowing hay, stuff like that, you probably want to start thinking about a cab tractor. And another thing that we have on the farm is a skid steer. If I had to do this again, I would have probably looked for a used tractor in the 75 plus horsepower range, anywhere from 75 to 110 horsepower. The bucket wouldn't have been as important to me. I would have bought a nice used skid steer. So that's my advice get a bigger tractor than you think you're going to need because you're going to make the same mistake that i made in buying an underpowered tractor for your farm and we've got a 110 horsepower tractor planned to come here to the farm within the next few weeks so come along we'll see you guys over on the stony ridge thanks a lot hank for inspiring community here on youtube in the farm world awesome bud see you guys on the channel hey thanks a lot josh i'll keep the outtake in there for you okay <laughs> Hey, our next guest is a really good friend of mine, Tony from Tony's Tractor Adventure. Again, I'm going to leave all of those channels and their links below in the description, so make sure you check them out. Tony's going to talk to us about making sure you research all the dealers before you decide on one, okay? And he does a lot better job of explaining that than I can, so take it away, Tony. Go ahead, bud. Hey, Hank. I really appreciate you having us on. 
Uh, first time tractor buyer mistakes. Gosh, let me think. There's, there, you know, I've made plenty myself, but probably the biggest tractor mistake I see being made when you're purchasing a tractor for the first time is we have preconceived notions. We have a specific color and a brand. We go to that dealer, look at only that particular dealer, and end up buying a tractor from that particular dealer, which may cost too much for, you know, for what you really need. May not be a, spur, a perfectly matched niche tractor. So we need to, uh, I, th I would tell you, don't go into buying a tractor with your mind made up a, on a specific brand color of tractor. Shop around, look at all the different tractor brands that are in your area. Are they gonna be here? So are they gonna be able to support you? Do they have a mechanic on hand? Those are mistakes that uh, I see uh, tractor buyers make. So the big one is they go into the market with a preconceived notion of what is the best tractor for them without actually ever doing any research. So the research is the key. Shop different dealers, different manufacturers. Gosh, the market is wide open now with great tractors. There's so many different manufacturers out there that make great tractors. So one other thing, just because it is a big tractor brand doesn't always mean it'll be in your area. Hey Hank, I really appreciate you again for having us on here. This is a great thing you're doing for our first time tractor buyers, it's awesome. Uh, again, my name is Tony from Tony's Tractor Adventure YouTube channel. Uh, if you wanna see firewood splitting, if you wanna see uh, logs cut up on a sawmill, and if you wanna see all kind of tractor work projects, come check us out, I really appreciate that. I told you guys, man, we've got tons of information in this video, and we're gonna keep going. Unless you've been living under a rock or something, you've seen this guy on YouTube. The next guest on our expert panel is Tractor Time with Tim. Tim, take it away, buddy. How about you, Hank? I decided I would talk today about resale value. It's kind of strange, you think, maybe to talk about reselling your tractor before you even buy your tractor. But in my opinion, that is exactly the time to think about it. I think of resale value as flexibility. There are all kinds of reasons why we might want to uh, sell our tractors. Uh, some folks say, no, I never consider selling anything. I keep everything I have forever. Um, but some things we just can't predict. <clears throat> some of the things are negative, maybe divorce or maybe a health situation where we just can't operate a tractor anymore. Those, of course, are very uh, negative situations. Some are kind of neutral, like I just don't have this property anymore, therefore I don't have the need for the tractor. But the one I want to focus on today is the opportunity aspect. It's really a positive side of choosing a tractor with a positive resale value. Now when we buy automobiles, uh, it, it seems like a treadmill. We're, we purchase an automobile and about the time we get it paid off, we have to buy another one. Well, tractors have so much better resellability, resale value, than cars that there's a hidden opportunity here. Let's say you buy this tractor right here, a subcompact tractor. You use the 0% financing. You drive that for several years, say three years or so, four years maybe. You're still making payments on it, I understand, but you realize at that point, I'd really like to have a larger machine, maybe like the one in the background there. If your tractor has a good resale value, you can make that trade keep your payments consistent or maybe even lower them to step into that larger machine. Or maybe it's a, a machine that has a backhoe versus one that didn't. Uh, uh, maybe it's just something that, that you find that you, you need uh, for whatever reason. Since tractors hold their value a little bit better than cars, we can kind of use them to build up equity or build up an asset a little bit like a house. Now, they're not gonna gain value like a house, but at least they're gonna hold their value. A lot of them will decline maybe one third in value and hold that value for the long term. And that's what we're looking for. What drives the resale value? Very quickly, I think it's one item, and that is parts availability. Early on, it's more of the perceived future parts availability, right? Almost every brand is available for the first few years. And it's the perception of, will this brand be around in 20 years, 25 years, when, 
when I need to get parts for this. Later on, you can see this uh, manifested itself uh, directly. Uh, for instance, there were some uh, gray market tractors sold here several years ago. Um, tremendous tractors, but there's no way to get parts for them. Once in a while, you'll see one of those for sale, and you say, oh my goodness, that seems like an incredible deal. Well, there's, there's no parts available. You'd have to like make your own parts, machine your own parts. I don't even know how you would get parts for some of those machines. It's the perception of future parts availability that's gonna drive your resale value. For that reason, I recommend buying from brands that are committed to the subcompact and compact tractor industry. You can tell that commitment by they've made their own, um, they're, they're heavily invested uh, in, in the future, maybe they're already profitable doing it. That would be uh, uh, some, some key features right there. I hope you find this helpful. I just think it's a good idea to consider resale value in your upfront purchase because you just never know. And the best, most optimal reason is you may want to upgrade that machine at a later time. Thanks, Hank, for giving us the chance to participate in your channel. We talk about resellability, we talk about ballast, we talk about all sorts of new tractor owner things on our channel, Tractor Time with Tim. Check us out. Tim, I appreciate you sharing those thoughts with us. Resale value is super important when you're thinking about purchasing a tractor. But something else you need to think about is seasonal changes when you own a tractor. And our good friend John from A Ritter Bit Will Do is gonna take care of that topic for us right now. John, what you got, buddy? Thank you, Hank, I appreciate it. Hey, I live up here in Minnesota, and one of the main reasons that I bought my tractor was to move snow around. So if you're in the same boat that I am, you're gonna to wanna to hear this. Stick around, I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the do's and don'ts of winterizing your tractor. The first winter that I had my tractor, it was a cold January day. It was 20 below zero. The snow was blowing all over the place. We had wind, it was, I, I remember it just being one of the most miserable times on my tractor I've ever had. I'm moving snow, I'm about three quarters of the way done and my tractor just shut down, okay? What happened is my fuel filter froze up, it gelled up and it was, that was not a fun thing to fix in the middle of my driveway, getting underneath the tractor because that's where that fuel filter is and I had to change it. My fingers were frozen, I'm crawled underneath the tractor in the winter blowing snow, not a fun situation. I don't ever want to repeat that and I don't want you to have to go through that either. So I'm going to tell you what to do to avoid a problem like that. Just because I had to learn the hard way does not mean you need to learn the hard way. Don't make the same mistake I did. Get yourself some fuel treatment, okay? This will keep your uh, fuels, your fuel line and your fuel filter from gelling up, from freezing up. You want to get some of this stuff in your fuel during the winter time, during the cold months, all right? Do not go without anything. In fact, even if your uh, fuel station that you get your fuel from winterizes their fuel, Add this anyways. You don't want to, you can't be too safe. You don't want to be in that situation that I was. Uh, this is, this will treat about 20 gallons of fuel, but I use about a third of it per jug of fuel that I go. So I put about a third of this into my five gallon jugs. Works great, never had a problem. Don't make the same mistake I did. Now, if you live in one of the cold states as I do, I bet somewhere along the lines you've had yourself a dead battery in your car, your truck, and you've needed some nice person to come and, and give you a jump with some jumper cables. Or maybe you've been on the other end of that and you've been that nice person helping somebody else out. Well, I've never had a problem with my tractor, and the reason is I always use this trickle charger in the wintertime when I'm not using the tractor. I leave this thing plugged right in. This is a Battery Tender Junior. It's about 20, 30 bucks online. Uh, it works really well. I've always had a always had a healthy battery, a fully charged battery, a couple clamps that go on the uh, battery terminals, and it's kept my tractor up and running. I've never had an issue with the battery. Hopefully I continue that luck this year. If you live in that cold weather climate, hopefully your dealership included a block heater for your tractor. So if you look down here on my tractor, I've got my tractor plugged in right now. You can see that it's got this uh, cord and there is a heating element on the other end of that cord that goes right into the engine block. And it works great. I've got my infrared thermometer right here and we're gonna take a reading on the block. It's about 32 degrees out today, this, this low 30s anyway, but let's take a look at the block temp. And we've got, look at that, 62. Are you guys seeing that? There we go, 62 degrees. I've only had this uh, block heater plugged in for about 20 minutes. 
it makes a world of difference when you're starting your tractor and you got the you got the engine that's already kind of warmed up for you so if you don't have a block heater contact your dealership get yourself one it really helps don't forget treat your fuel take care of your battery get yourself a block heater those three things will make a world of difference for you if you have any further questions regarding anything we went over today or anything that you may have seen on my YouTube channel, please feel free to join our Facebook group. Our Facebook group is called A Ritter Bit Will Do. There you can chat with me, post pictures, and uh, see what we've been up to here on the channel. So until next time, keep on tractoring. God bless. And now, back to you, Hank. Hey, thanks, John. I appreciate it, buddy. You know, we don't worry too much about snow down here in Florida, right? So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Our next expert on this panel has one of the fastest growing YouTube channels in the tractor community. Mike Morgan from Outdoors with the Morgans is going to share some precautions you need to think about when you're researching or buying new tractors. Take it away, Mike. Thanks Hank and hi everyone this is Mike from Outdoors with the Morgans. Today I want to tell you about a little secret that a lot of new tractor buyers aren't aware of and actually a few veteran tractor owners aren't aware of it either. This morning here I'm using the uh, Kubota MX5400 with the uh, Land Pride land plane and I'm spreading some 2A limestone on top of this geotextile here around the new building. It's working out really well. Now this tractor, it works great for that. And so does this BX23S. So if you're in the market for a new tractor, you're probably already doing your research. You know, you're checking out the tractor Facebook groups, you're looking at tractor forums on the internet, you're watching YouTube videos, hopefully Outdoors with the Morgans is on that list. But sometimes what you'll find when you're searching in those places is people doing things with tractors that they probably shouldn't be doing. Now don't get me wrong, you can get an incredible amount of work done with a tractor, even a little BX23S like this. As a matter of fact, this tractor right here, you can do almost everything that you can do with this big MX5400. Obviously, you know, you have a difference in lift capacity, but you can pretty much do the same types of work with these. These are like a Swiss Army knife, you know, you can mow with them, you can dig trenches with it, you can do loader work, brush hogging, grading driveways, you can do tons of different things with these, but they're not a skid loader and they're not an excavator. You know, like this backhoe on this BX23S, I use this all the time. I just did all the drain lines, you know, for the downspouts around the new building here. I've dug some lines down at the uh, brick house that we own down the road, all sorts of things. But when you're going into this, keep in mind, this is by no means a mini excavator. But not too many people, you know, just landowners, are going to go out and spend $70,000 on, on a designated excavator like that. That's where these tractors come into play. So to kind of review what we talked about, basically this is the way I look at it. And keep in mind, this is just my opinion. If you just bought a piece of property that's like raw land, you've got to clear a whole bunch of trees, you need to build a new driveway, dig the foundation for your house, I wouldn't buy a tractor. I would buy a skid loader or an excavator or rent that equipment or hire somebody to do that initial work. Once you're kind of established and you're just in the mode of, you know, improvements and maintenance, that's where a tractor comes into play. Sure, you can do the same type of work with this little BX23S as you can a skid loader, but it's just going to take a lot longer and you're going to tear your tractor up doing work that it wasn't designed for. 
But anyway, that's really all I have to say about that. I want to thank Hank for putting this video together. And once again, if you haven't checked out our channel, Outdoors with the Morgans, check it out. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks. Man, we've heard from a lot of people that are expert tractor operators and have a lot of knowledge about owning tractors in general, right? But they've all been operators. What about people that actually sell tractors for a living? Let's hear from Courtney from Good Works Tractors because he's got some excellent ideas and thoughts that he wants to share with you. Courtney, what you got? Hank, how you doing, man? Thanks so much for the opportunity to participate in this video and share with your viewers. Great video idea, by the way. For you guys in the market for a tractor, I'm telling you, you're going about your budget the wrong way. I see it all the time here at my shop. Well, that's not true. Sometimes you guys have it figured out. But for a lot of you guys, myself included, I'm guilty, I get it. You see the shiny green paint, orange, red, blue, whatever color, and you think, all right, I gotta save up, I gotta save whatever it is, or get the down payment, or finance, or be able to budget a monthly payment for whatever that tractor costs there. That's my goal. No, that's not your goal. Do you see all this out here? This is where the fun really begins, okay? I know that tractor is fun to sit on and in your mind, you're dreaming about riding around on it, just putzing around, having fun. I love to do that too. But right out here, all these attachments, this is what gets that work done, okay? So the tractor, it's kind of the, the base tool, you know? It's the Swiss Army knife when it's all folded up. And as you start to open different little attachments on there, that's what all these things are, okay? On the front end, on the back end, sometimes underneath, you got a budget for that other stuff that's going to go along with your tractor and help you get your projects done. You also got a plan for safety, okay? So that counterweight, nearly all of us subcompact, compact tractor owners, even smaller utility owners, you have a front end loader on there. What happens if you scoop up a big load of dirt? Well, that tractor is just going to want to tip right over unless you got weight on the back side there to even it out. Something like a ballast box here has some suitcase weights, you get wheel weights, you get liquid ballast. Lots of times you need a combination of two or three of those methods there to be safely planted to the ground. Trust me when I say that is not something you want to say, meh, I'm going to see how it goes. Maybe I'll add it on later if I need it. Grease, baby. Well, maintenance in general, all right? You can't just think you're not going to have to do anything to the machine. So plan ahead. Get yourself some maintenance stuff here. You know, grease is a really good thing. Maybe buy yourself a couple oil change kits, air filters some tools, just some basic stuff to have around and at the ready, maybe keep it in a toolbox on your tractor or just right inside the shop door. You got to have that stuff on hand because you know what? If it's not there to do it when you think you need to have it done, a lot of us just don't get it done. Okay. So make sure you have it there at the ready. That way you can tackle it when it needs to be done. Now I know a lot of you guys are going to trailer equipment, right? Whether it's between properties, you know, up North, down South, parents' house, brother's house, friend's house, maybe taking on some side jobs. You gotta think about that, all right? You wanna make sure you have enough trailer as well. Don't go buying a trailer that's just too small and only gonna fit the tractor on there. Things like a brush hog, man, they take up like an extra seven foot. A 20 foot trailer barely does it justice. So plan ahead because that part of your budget might be quite a bit larger than you thought. Where are you gonna keep that shiny new piece of equipment you have? Or nearly new if you're buying from Good Works Tractors. The last thing you wanna do is let that thing sit outside, fade away. It's not good for the paint. It's not good for the polymer or the steel panels. I don't care which one it is. It's not good for the rubber hoses. It's not good for the tires. It's just not good for the equipment to sit there and get baked on by the sun. So whether you're gonna store that inside a building, a barn, a garage, put it under a canopy, at least get a tarp or a cover, put something over top of it, but keep it out of the elements. So that's just another cost you gotta plan for and at least have an idea in mind of what you're gonna do with that. I love planning, so go into it with the right plan with all the different facets of that budget considered. Well, that's a wrap for me, Courtney with Good Works Tractors, goodworkstractors.com. Back to you, Hank. I appreciate that, Courtney. Some very solid advice that you're offering. Hey, listen, we've got a couple more, so make sure you're sticking around till the end of this video because we're not done yet. And our next expert, I like to call him the graybeard of the group, right? Every group needs like a senior leader. This guy's been on YouTube a long time, knows everything there is to know about tractors and tractor dealerships. So I want my good friend Mike from Tractor Mike to give you some insight on some things that you need to think about as you're researching or buying new tractors. Mike, what you got, buddy? Hank, one thing I think a lot of people don't look at when they're buying a tractor is the people that back it up. I know we want to get the specs right, we want to get the right size tractor, we want to get the right options and all that and people get to be really focused on that and, and maybe the brand and kind of forget about who's selling the brand because it's a people business. You know, there's 11 or 12 major brands of tractors in North America, and, and I think I would be personally happy if, if they met the specs with any of them, any of their tractors. 
So the thing to me that really differentiates one tractor from another is not the brand or the color of paint or the, any of that, it's the dealer. So I recommend when you're shopping for a tractor, find a dealer that you trust, that you kind of click with, that you get along with, and that you know will be around to take care of you over the life of that tractor and buy whatever they're selling and develop a good relationship with them because they're going to be taking care of you, especially if you're new to tractors. You're going to be asking a lot of questions. You're going to need a little bit more training than their ag market is, hand holding along the way. Yeah, and, and so you want a good relationship with them. And one last thing, there's one person in that dealership you really want to be in good with, and that's the service manager. And the best way to get in, in good with the service folks is take them donuts once in a while. If you bring in a couple of dozen donuts about 8.30 in the morning to that dealership and set them on the service manager's desk, they are going to love you. And they're who's going to take care of you if you have a major warranty problem. They're going to go to bat for you with the company. If you have a major failure, they're going to decide how many hours it took to fix it and, and what they charged you. And they're going to be, a lot of times, the people you call when you have an issue. So it's good to be known as a donut person and not the yelling and screaming when something goes wrong person. So develop a good relationship with the dealer and take that service manager donuts once in a while. Hey, solid advice, Mike, especially the donut part, right? I love donuts and I know someone else who loves donuts too. Hey, Brandon, what's up, hey, man? Hey, Hank, I heard something about donuts, <laughs> yeah, right? <I> so. <laughs> Have a seat, man. All right. So we've been doing a video on experts that are giving their advice to like new tractor owners or first-time tractor buyers. And we've had experts offer some really, really strong advice about, you know, what to purchase, when to purchase, awesome. things like that. And so I want to talk about implements that you should buy when you first buy your tractor. So, Brando, when you bought your tractor, what was the first implement that you bought and was was it a good decision or would you have done something different what's your what's your take on that so yeah hank so i really whenever i bought my tractor i had no idea what i was going to need so i just kind of bought a couple things that were used on the lot so i bought a boom pole right. and a ballast box yeah so one was a good decision one was not <laughs> such a good decision yeah um so yeah the boom pole you know who needs a boom pole really when you've got a front end loader For sure that's kind of what i found out eventually whenever i got a really good Good and useful implement my grapple right the, the ballast box came in really handy yeah. though, so. so a lot of new tractor buyers or a lot of tractor guys that are researching buying tractors or wanting to buy a tractor for the first time they look into these package deals and I think people have to be careful about that you know what I mean because a you don't know well a it depends on who the implement maker is the size of the trailer, the rating of the trailer, things like that. So what do you think about, I personally think a box blade and a grapple are excellent choices for first implements for a tractor owner. Yeah, Hank, I totally agree. The box blade is a great implement. Mm. I personally don't use it, but I, I don't have a lot of roads to take care of sure. or anything like that. However, just like you said, the grapple, that's going to be the most yeah. used implement, I think, for anybody. I never take it off my tractor. So that's by far what I would suggest more than anything. Yeah, I think so. Because, well, if you're buying a grapple, you got to make sure that you think about the third function kit that's, you know, plumbed into the system as well because that's an added expense. Courtney talked about earlier in the video budgeting for implements and things like that. So I think that if you're going to get a grapple, you know, plan for it, budget for it, get a good one. You know, of course, we use Homestead implements here on Hamiltonville Farm. But I think that, you know, those costs associated with that, just like Courtney was saying, are very, very important. But for as far as your property, your property will dictate what implement you need to buy. Hank, you know, actually, whenever I bought my tractor, I was going to add the third function to it at the time of purchase. Okay. But my dealer actually talked me out of it. Huh. Um, he said, oh, they, you know, you, you might not use it a lot, so it might get corrosion in the connections or something. I found that I use, like I said, the grapple more than anything. So really what you have to do is not just think about today what you need, but, you know, really what are you going to think or what are you going to use two years, three years down the road? No, that's an excellent point, yeah. Yeah, so that you can have all of the tools right there with you, you know, so your tractor can be prepared with rear remotes, third function, maybe right. even cruise control or link pedals, stuff like that, to make your tractor more usable as well with those implements. Well, man, that's, that's a lot to process, a lot of information in this video to, to, to think out. 
Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a ton of information with a lot of really knowledgeable folks. If I were y'all, I would definitely bookmark this video sure. so that you can refer back to it later on, um, you know, in that one year, two year, three year process because some of the information that you've presented doesn't really matter. Like resale right now, doesn't matter to them. Maybe two or three years, it might matter. Yeah, I agree with that. It's a, uh, it's, and I want to thank all the experts that were on the panel today. It was a great video, and I tell you, it's, it's to get all these guys, get all these heavy hitters into the same video. It's just an amazing thing to share their knowledge with you guys who are doing your research. Maybe you have recently purchased a tractor and you're still trying to learn it. So I really appreciate all the guests today. They've, they've done a really, really outstanding job. Brand, I appreciate you coming over, man. Thanks for yeah, having me. I know, I'm sorry there weren't donuts, but... Uh... I mean, bait, bait and switch. Get me over here for yeah, I know, time, I know. So. so I'll buy your lunch. Hey, that's it. I <laughs> so, like that. Hey, thanks a lot for watching. We appreciate it. Again, I'm going to put all the channel links in the description below. Make sure you go subscribe to all the channels that were on the video today. And over my shoulder right here is a little white circle. Make sure you click on that to subscribe for more content like this. And of course, uh, underneath it is a video you can go watch from Hamiltonville Farm. We appreciate you guys. Take care. God bless.